Father, I just pray that you would use these great truths, that they would uh, help us to study the Bible better and learn the Bible in a greater way. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now my text verse tonight is the verse there in 2 Timothy 2.15 where the Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now I want to preach to you tonight on the subject of how to study the Bible. How to study the Bible. It's going to be a very practical message about how to read the Bible, how to study the Bible. I'm going to give you ten points on how to study the Bible. Now first of all, in way of introduction, look at 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Look, God does not approve of a Christian who does not study the Bible. You see that? God does not put his approval on somebody who doesn't know the Bible. There, if a person does not know the Bible, God disapproves of that. And he says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. He's saying, look, if you don't know the Bible, you should be ashamed of yourself. And you're going to be put to shame. Boy, have you ever talked to somebody about something? You know, you're trying to win somebody to the Lord, or you're trying to talk to somebody and, and uh, straighten them out and, and get them in church or what have you, and then they'll say something to you, and you just don't have an answer for them because you just don't know the Bible, and you just don't know where to go, or you don't know what to show them. And sometimes people can put you to shame. I mean, a new believer, maybe somebody who doesn't know the Bible very well, and then they get to talking to somebody who's, who's a, you know, one of these cults or what have you, a Mormon, Jehovah's Witness. They might put you to shame if you don't know the Bible. And so God says, look, you need to study the Bible, number one, to get my approval. He says, I want you to know the Bible. And number two, so that you're not put to shame before those that you're dealing with. Before those that you're trying to win to Christ. Before those that you're trying to preach the gospel and the truth to. And so studying the Bible is vitally important. It's important to know the Bible. You know, we live in a day where knowledge of the Bible is minimized. The, the idea of knowing a lot of Bible is put on the back burner. It's just the heart that matters, what people will teach. Or, well, it's just important that you love God and that you obey God. But look, God says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. He said of the Jews, they have a zeal for God. Man, they're excited about serving God. He said they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And so without the knowledge in this book, imagine... If I were to tell you, I, you know what, God wants you to just sell out for God and live for God all the time, every day, all your energy, everything that you have towards serving God. And then think about this. What if you did that and you said, I'm just going to give it everything I've got. But what if you were doing the, the wrong thing? You know, that wasn't what God wanted you to spend your life. I mean, good night. There are people who spend their lives in a... In a uh, in a, I don't know what it's called, where these, uh, a convent, where these nuns go, you know, or, or they spend their whole life serving God in their mind. They spend their whole life depriving themselves of things that they could have had, and they spend their life and their zeal on something that's wrong. Why? Because they didn't take the time to see what the Bible says, to study and learn what the Bible says. And so I don't want to give my life to something and be spinning my wheels because I don't know what's true. I don't even know if what I'm doing is right. And so studying the Bible is the most important thing that there is in the world, knowing what the Bible says. Now, let me give you ten things on studying the Bible. Now, number one, I'm just going to briefly touch on this because we all know this, but number one, when you're studying the Bible, make sure that you have the right Bible. That's the first thing that you have to do. Because if you're going to spend your life studying something, good night. You don't want to study something that's the wrong thing and spend all that time just spinning your wheels. Let me just give you a few scriptures on that. I'll just read these for you. 2 Corinthians 2.17 For we are not as many. Catch that word, many. There's a lot of people doing this. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God. In the sight of God speak we in Christ. He said, look, there's many people out there who corrupt the word of God, who change God's word, who defile it and alter it. That's what corruption is. It alters its form. And then Ezekiel 13, the Bible says, They have seen vanity and lying divination, saying, The Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them. And they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. Have ye not seen a vain vision, and have ye not spoken a lying divination? Whereas ye say, The Lord saith it, albeit I have not spoken. See, God is saying, Look, there are people out there who are preaching what they claim is God's word, and it's not God's word at all. It's not what God has said at all. So number one, of course, make sure that you have the right Bible. Number two, the best thing that you could do, the next thing, make sure you have the right Bible, the King James Bible. But number two, get a Bible that's only the Bible. 
You know what I'm saying? Just get a Bible that's just the Bible. I mean, not all the text and all the notes. You get some of these Bibles and literally the first third of the page will be the Bible text and then the whole bottom is just notes and commentaries and then they'll stick a thing in the column with all the notes and commentaries and switch out, it'll say in the column, you know, switch out this word for this word and this word for this word and go here and read this. And, and look, the best thing that you could do, and I'm not telling you it's wrong to have a Bible like that, but I'm telling you this, I'm giving you 10 tips on how to say the Bible and how to learn the Bible better. And if you get a Bible that just has the Bible, you will learn more with a Bible like that. I remember when I was a kid, I had the Bibles with just everything. I mean, all the notes, all the commentaries. And I would just get off on a tangent. I'd start reading the Bible. I'd read about three or four verses, and I'd see a little three next to a word. And I'd say, oh, what's that mean? I'd go down to the bottom, I'd find the three, and it would start talking about other things, and I'd read the whole thing. And it would tell me, go over here and read this. And I'd go over there and read that. And boy, I'd spend an hour on that one thing. And I didn't get anywhere in reading the Bible. And so number one, make sure you got the right Bible, the King James Bible. Number two, get a Bible. The best Bible that, that I would recommend is a Bible that just has the text of the Bible. Nothing else. As little else as you can. The most stripped down, just the text of the King James Bible. Now number three, before you get too involved with studying the Bible. And this sermon's about studying the Bible. It's also just about reading the Bible. Read the Bible cover to cover at least five times before you think about studying the Bible. I mean, think about it. Before you're going to take a microscope and take one little part of the Bible and dissect it and study it and learn it and get it down, see the big picture. You see, you're not going to be able to understand the small parts of the Bible and really get into it until you see the big picture. I remember when I was a teenager. I was 17 years old. And my, that's what my pastor said. He said, read the Bible five times cover to cover before you even think about studying the Bible. And that's what I did when I was 17. was the first time I ever read the Bible cover to cover. When I was 18 years old, I divided the year up into four parts. I said, this year I'm going to read the Bible four times so that I'll be qualified to even study the Bible, to even learn the Bible, so I can see the big picture. And boy, when I was 18 years old, each of those three-month periods, I read through the Bible cover to cover. And boy, I'll tell you what, I, I learned the Bible. I started to see the big picture. And I didn't know, obviously I was 18, you know, I didn't know a whole lot after just five times of reading it. But after those five times, God kind of just opened up the big picture to me. And I could see a little more of the big picture. And then after that, if I would study the Bible, I would learn so much more. You see, Paul said in Acts 20, 27, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. He said, I preach this whole book. That's what Paul said. I preach all of it. I declare all the counsel of God. And he said, furthermore, in Matthew 4, 4, Jesus said, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. God says, I expect you to live by every word in this book. It's impossible to live by every word in this book if you don't know every word in this book. You're not going to know every word in this book unless you read it cover to cover. Now, you may not necessarily like to read it in order. I've never read it cover to cover in order. I've never started in Genesis and read the Revelation in order. I skip around, I check off which books I've read, but I always make sure that I'm going to read every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That I'm going to get the whole counsel of God. And so those are the three very rudimentary things. And that's just kind of an introduction to the story. It's probably something that you already know. But number four, this is a very important part of the message. Number four, you go with the statement above the story. Okay? Always put the statement above the story. Now, what is the Bible filled with? Well, it's filled with stories. But it's also filled with statements from God. Now, sometimes the statements and the stories contradict each other. I'll be honest with you. Very often, you're going to find a statement and a story that contradicts it. Which one are you going to trust? What are you going to go with? What the story says or what the statement says? See, you have to understand that this book is not all just what God is telling you. This is also God telling you about what people did that might have been right and might have been wrong. This is also God telling you about what people said that may be right or may be wrong. Let me give you some examples. Turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 2. I'm going to show you what I mean by this statement versus story. Look at Luke chapter 2 verse number 33. Luke chapter 2, verse number 33, the Bible reads here, And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Now look, the King James Bible, God's Word, when God wrote this, he's very careful to call Joseph, Joseph, and not Jesus' father. He says, 
And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of. Of course, the NIV changes it to his father and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Calling Joseph Jesus' father. Now, is Joseph Jesus' father? Now, you have to understand when you're reading the Bible, and remember this sermon is about how to study the Bible. How to interpret what the Bible is saying. Look, if you're reading the Bible, in the book of Luke, it says here, and Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. That statement is being spoken by the narrator. Okay, do you understand what I mean by that? The author of the book, Luke, is saying that. Now, every, now is the book of Luke God's word? Absolutely. So when you're reading the narrator speaking, everything you're reading must be true because the Bible is saying it. Because the Bible is telling you Joseph and his mother marveled. Now, if you, I, I showed that to, to one of these preachers, you know, one of these NIV type preachers. I said, hey, look, here's a mistake in your Bible. You know, your Bible's phony. And it's what they said. They said, okay, look down at verse 48. Go with me to verse 48 and I'll show you what he showed me. It says, and when they saw him, they were amazed. It's talking about Joseph and Mary. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. Now, does that call Joseph Jesus' his father? It does, doesn't it? He, Mary says, Thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. But see, here's what you have to understand. The narrator is not speaking. The Bible is not speaking right now. The Bible is telling us what Mary said. Do you understand that? So the difference is, the narrator is not speaking. The narrator is telling us, this is what Mary said. So is Luke 2.48 true? Yes, it's true because Mary did say that. Is what she said true? No. What Mary said in verse 48 is wrong because she referred to Joseph as Jesus' father, which is wrong. Look if you would, there's one great example of how when the narrator is speaking, that's true. But when it's a quote of another person, he's just telling you what they said. And they may or they may not be telling the truth. I'll show you a better example. Look at the book of Job. Verse number 42 of the book of Job, right before Psalms, right at the center of your Bible. Job 42. And this will help you to understand the Bible because I've seen people get hung up about this. Or I've seen people base what they believe on what a person in the Bible says, but it's not necessarily what the Bible is saying. It's just what a person says. Look at, look at Job 42 and look at verse number 7. And this will really help you in your understanding of the book of Job especially. But look at Job 42 verse 7. And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends. Now watch this next phrase. For you have not spoken of me the thing that is right as my servant Job hath. Now here's God speaking saying, listen, Eliphaz, and listen, your two friends. You three have spoken wrong things about me. That's what he's saying. He's saying, you've spoken wrong things about me. He says, for you've not spoken of me the thing that is right as my servant Job hath. So he's saying, what Job has said about me was right. What you and your two friends have said about me was wrong. Look at the latter part of verse number 8. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, and that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. Again, he says the same thing. He says, the three friends have spoken wrong things about me, about Job, whereas Job spoke right. He was speaking God's word. Now look at the book of Job with me. Look at chapter number... Turn to chapter number 4 of the book of Job. Now I'm going to show you something. Chapter number 4, verse 1. Everybody there, Job 4, 1. Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered and said. Now the entire chapter 4 and the entire chapter 5 is spoken by Eliphaz the Temanite. Which God says at the end of the book, he spoke wrong. Do you see what I'm saying? So here you have two chapters of somebody speaking things that are wrong in the Bible. Two chapters of the Bible that are somebody saying something that's wrong. Then look at chapter 6, verse 1. But Job answered and said, and then you have chapters 6 and 7, which are what Job is saying, which is what God has said. This is right. This is God's word. Then in chapter number 8, it says, Then answered Bildad the Shuhite and said, and the whole chapter 8 is somebody speaking that's wrong. Then in chapter 9 it says, Then Job answered and said, And you've got right in chapter 9. Right in chapter 10. Chapter 11. 
Then answered Zophar the Neamathite and said, Job chapter 11 is just wrong. You can't trust what the, you can't base what you believe on what's in Job chapter 11 because it's a man speaking who God said this man is speaking wrong. Now is Job chapter 11 true? Yes, it is true because that is what he said. But is what he said true? No, what he said is not true because God said it's not true. And then in chapter 12, we're back to Job. 13 is Job. 14 is Job. Chapter number 15, we're back to the friends that are wrong. And on and on and on and on and on. You see, throughout this whole book, you'll find that about half of the book is spoken by people that are not necessarily telling the truth. Now, some of the things that they say are right. But a lot of things that they say are wrong. I mean, they're telling Job that he's a wicked sinner and that he deserves everything and that he brought it upon himself. That's just not true. And God said at the end that they spoke fallacy concerning the nature of God. And so you have to understand when you're reading the Bible, you have to be able to differentiate between something that God is saying in the Bible, something that the narrator is saying in the Bible, you know it's true. Because the narrator is saying it. Whereas something that a person says in the Bible, it could be true, it could be not true. Just like if I say something to you, Maybe it's true. Maybe it's not true. But it's not authoritative when I speak like when God speaks. And it's not authoritative when people in the Bible speak as opposed to God speaking, the narrator in the Bible. Think, think about this. So that, that's the difference between a quotation in the Bible and the narrator speaking. You have to be able to differentiate. But how about this? Just a story versus a statement. Here's a story. Jesus turned the water into wine. Now, of course, if you study the Bible, you'll learn that the word juice does not occur in the Bible. And that the word wine is just meaning juice. The Bible talks about in Isaiah chapter 66, wine being inside of a grape that's still on the vine before it's even been picked. So don't tell me that's alcoholic beverage inside of a grape that's on a vine. And on and on, you can find all kinds of examples like that. But people will say, see, look, didn't Jesus make the water into wine? Didn't Jesus drink wine at the Last Supper? See, it's okay to drink. And they're taking a story of what happened and basing what they believe on the story and they're bypassing the clear statement. Here's the clear statement. Look at Proverbs. If you're in Job, just flip forward two books. Look at Proverbs chapter 23 and we'll see the clear statement that God makes about alcohol. Here in Proverbs chapter 23, if you look at verse number 32, God differentiates between two kinds of wine here. In chapter 23, verse 32, he says, 31, I'm sorry, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red. This is in verse number 31 of chapter 23. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. He's saying, look, there's a certain beverage that you're never supposed to even look at it so wicked. And he says, at the last it biteth like a serpent. And stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. That's the description of being under the influence of alcohol. You say ungodly things, you see, perver you see uh, strange women, and you get into trouble. I mean, look, God is saying there's a certain beverage that you're not supposed to even look at. And if you took and looked at every time the word wine occurs in the Bible, it's either a very positive description, talking about just a fruit juice, something that God made, or it's an extremely negative description saying that it's wicked, it's ungodly, it's sinful, it'll, it'll cause you to do wrong. And, and the Bible talks a lot about it. If you look it up in the concordance, you'll see many different references to wine in the Bible. And so, am I just going to take some story about, well, I found a guy in the Old Testament that drank wine one time. So God must be condoning it. No, look, God has a clear statement here that says don't even look at alcoholic beverage. And so if he says don't even look at it here... No story is going to change my mind about that where somebody did it or somebody said it or I think somebody did it. I mean, you expect me to believe Jesus is creating something out of nothing. He's taking water and turning it into wine. If you know what alcohol is, it's a decayed process. Look, when God creates something, Jesus himself in the book of Revelation said, Behold, I make all things new. Okay, why would he make some old, decayed, wicked beverage that makes people drunk? And create that out of water. But that's what happens when you just take a story and run with it instead of going with what the Bible clearly states. Think about this. People will say, well, women preachers. You know, you talk about, you know, what Joyce Meyer or one of these, you know, these women preachers. Or I think Billy Graham's daughter is some preacher. And these different women preachers. And they say, well, look. In the Bible, what about Deborah? She was a prophetess. And this is what they'll say. Deborah in Judges chapter 4 and 5 was a prophetess. And so it must be okay. Well, look, that's a story 
Here's a statement. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And then, of course, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, Let the women keep silence in your churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. And so, that's the clear statement of the Bible. God's clear teaching. And you just take some story and say, Well, this woman was a preacher in the Old Testament, so it must be okay. Now look, you start with the statement, and you just nail that down. I know that women preachers are wrong, because the Bible says it clearly in a statement. Then you go back and interpret the story. It never gives any reference to her preaching publicly in the whole story. She talks to one man. She prophesies to one man, to Barak. She never gets up in front of some crowd and preaches. She prophesies to one man. In the New Testament, Stephen's seven daughters that were prophetesses, they prophesied to one man, the Apostle Paul. They weren't up holding preaching services and crusades with Christian rock bands and getting up and uh, preaching on a stage. It was totally different. But see, that's what happens when you just interpret the Bible based on a story. Think about multiple wives. David had two or three wives, you know. Uh, Joseph, I'm sorry, Jacob had four wives. And they'll go through all this. Why, why can't I have more than one wife? You know, Abraham more than one wife. Look, go with the statement. Where God said, therefore shall a man leave father and mother and cleave unto his wife, singular, and they too shall be one flesh. Okay. It says, from the beginning it was not so. God made them male and female. That's God's original intent. That was God's plan, was one man and one woman to be married. And so to sit there and say, well, this guy had two wives. Look, just because he did it doesn't mean that it's right. A lot of people in the Old Testament did a lot of things that were very wrong. And so just because somebody did something doesn't make it right. You have to go by the clear statement of God's word. And on and on. There's, I have a couple other examples. Listen, there's a story in Judges 17 that's just completely off the wall story. And these people are saying, God is pleased with me. Because I've made this idol and, and, uh, and I've got this Levi and they have this big elaborate thing where they build this idol and they say, man, God is really blessing us. And if you read that, and, and they call, they have this priest that they hire. They hire a priest for money to be their personal priest and preach to him. It's in Judges 17. And they set up an, idol, an idolatrous image to Jehovah God, which is obviously totally wrong. And they say, boy, God is blessing us. God loves us because look how we've got this priest. We've got our idol. And they call the priest Father. He says, I'm going to call you Father. Look, it's a wrong story because we have the clear commands of God. And we'll see how the story ends up. If you read Judges 17 and 18, it ends up in disaster. But you can't take a story and base your doctrine on a story. First get the statements down. First get all the commandments of God nailed down. First get all the clear commands nailed down. Then use the statement to interpret the story. Don't use the story to interpret the statement. Don't put the story up here and the statement down here. Put the statement number one. Because that's just what God says. And then compare that with what God tells you about people's lives. And use the statement to interpret the story. But don't use the story and throw out the statement. So put the statement above the story. That's number four. Number five, when you're reading, the, when you're studying the Bible, you must compare spiritual things with spiritual. The Bible says in, uh, you know I didn't even write that verse down for some reason. I wrote down every other verse, but I think I know where it is. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, if you want to turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let's see if I can find it. Yep, here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The Bible says in verse number 11, or I'm sorry, verse number 10, But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. It's talking about the deep things in the Bible. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. See, in that verse number 13, he's saying two things. He's saying, number one, the words that we use when we speak are not the words of man's wisdom. We use the terminology that God uses in the Bible. That's what he's saying. He's saying we don't speak using terms that the world came up with when it comes to the things of God. 
We use God's terminology. What do I mean by that? I'm talking about using God's terminology like this is called a church. Not Faithful Word Baptist Ministries. Okay, no. This is Faithful Word Baptist Church. We use words like getting saved. Not making a commitment to Christ. Not turning over your life to Christ. Or coming into a relationship with Jesus Christ. These are not terms that are used by the Bible. The word relationship is not found in the Bible. The word commitment is not found in the Bible. The word ministries is not found in the Bible. We use the words that the Holy Ghost teacheth, not the words that man's wisdom teacheth. Because we use terms like believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. We use words like salvation. We use words like the blood of Jesus Christ. We don't use terms coined by the world like we need to get plugged in. You need to connect with the message. We want to get connected. You know, we want, look, I don't use those kind of terms. I use the terms that the Holy Ghost teaches. I use Bible words. And so when I talk about the things of God, I use a Bible word. I don't use words like Christophany, Theophany, Proto-Evangelium. I don't use those words. Those are theological terms made up by Dr. Fatbottom in some university somewhere. I want to use the words taught by the Holy Ghost. This Bible is a sufficient spiritual vocabulary for me. And so I don't need to borrow words from some theologian. I want to use the words that God's wisdom teacheth. And see, he says, use the words which the Holy Ghost teacheth and compare spiritual things to spiritual. Now let me ask you something. If you've got your Bible in your, in your one hand, and you've got Webster's Dictionary in the other hand, are you comparing spiritual things with spiritual? No, you're comparing carnal or fleshly. Carnal means fleshly or just natural. So you've got the carnal uh, dictionary in this hand, the King James Bible in this hand. That's not spiritual to spiritual. You're holding a commentary in this hand written by a man, and you've got the Holy Bible in this hand. You're not comparing spiritual with spiritual. But if you've got 1 Corinthians in this finger... And then you flip over here to Ecclesiastes. Now you're comparing spiritual with spiritual. And that's how you study the Bible. You compare, when it says compare spiritual with spiritual, it's saying compare scripture with scripture. I mean, take one verse here and then say, you know, there's a verse over here. Okay, and I put those two together and I, and I can get some truth. It can make sense. I can see what God's trying to say, the big picture, when I compare this verse with this verse. Not this verse with this dictionary. Not this verse with this Greek lexicon. Not this verse with this commentary. But comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Why? Because we want to use the words that the Holy Ghost teaches. Not the words of man's wisdom that man teaches. You see, God said, and I realize this is talking about changing the Bible, but God said in Revelation 22, 18, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of this prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And so God says, don't add to my word. Now, I realize that that's talking about, you know, adding to it and saying that it's scripture. You know, putting in a new book of the Bible or adding on to the book of Matthew, adding a few things in here and there like modern Bible versions do. But in the same token, I don't need to add some kind of a truth besides the truth that's been revealed in the Bible and say, I have a new truth. You need to read my book and my commentary so I can teach you things that are not in the Bible, but you need to know these things. Don't add to the Bible. The Bible is sufficient. If it wasn't enough, then God wouldn't swear to us and say, do not add to it, because it's enough. 1 John 2.27, this is a great verse. But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. It's talking about the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. He says, look, you don't need anybody to teach you the Bible. He says, if you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, he will teach you all things. I mean, he, anything you need to know about the Bible, you can learn from the Holy Spirit reading the Bible. And so that's why you don't need extra biblical books. That's why you don't need a commentary. That's why you don't need a dictionary. You need to just study the Bible and, yes, compare Scripture with Scripture. And if you know the whole Bible, then you can compare things in the Old Testament to the New Testament and so forth. You can compare things in Matthew with things in Luke. And God will give you the same account of the same story, but in a slightly different way. You can compare those two Scriptures the Matthew account and the Luke account, and you can learn great truth by putting those side by side and looking at them. You'll see things that you would not see otherwise. So quick review. Number one, make sure you have the right Bible. Number two, get a Bible that's just only the Bible. Number three, read the Bible five times cover to cover. It's vital. That's the, that's the first goal to work on. 
Number four, you go with the statement above the story. Number five, you compare spiritual things with spiritual. Number six, and this is very important, pray for God to teach you the Bible. Pray to God. When you go to read the Bible, open the Bible and pray to God that He will teach you the Bible, that He will show you something in the Bible. Psalm 119.18 says, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. I've prayed that to God hundreds of times. I've just said, God, open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Now, God's going to answer that prayer. If you ask God to show you something in the Bible, He will answer that prayer. Number seven, go soul winning or preach sermons. If you're a man, you preach sermons. But see, going soul winning or preaching a sermon, you're teaching someone else the Bible. Look at Romans chapter 2, verse 21. Turn in your Bible to Romans 2, 21. I'll show you this. Romans chapter 2, verse 21. Romans 2, 21, the Bible reads, Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? He's saying, look, isn't it true that when you teach someone else, you're also teaching yourself at the same time? That's what he's saying there. He's saying, thou that teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Look, when I go out soul winning, and I give somebody the gospel, things will come into my mind. I will think of illustrations. I'll think of verses in the Bible that I didn't really think about before, that I didn't really know before. Because God will lead me to certain verses and teach me the Bible as I'm teaching someone else how to be saved. I'll learn things. When I'm up uh, preaching a sermon, I will learn things. Things will come into my mind that I never would have learned otherwise. Because when you teach someone else, you usually end up teaching yourself a lot. And so when you show someone else things in the Bible, when you show a friend something that you learned in the Bible, when you show someone how to be saved, when you show somebody what the right Bible is, when you show somebody about eternal security, when you show somebody these things, you will learn a lot in the process. So using the Word of God that you've learned is going to cause you to learn more by teaching it to somebody else. You learn the most. I mean, good night. My kids have the Romans Road memorized. They have the Salvation Verses memorized. When they were tiny, just because they just heard it being taught to someone else so much, they picked it up in the process. I mean, the one verse that I never had to work on memorizing are the verses that I use for soul winning. I never had to work. Just, just from opening my Bible so many times, you say, man, I have a hard time memorizing Scripture. Look, if you open your Bible like 500 times and show somebody, okay, Romans 3.23... For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You're, you're going to know that verse after a while. I mean, for the 527th time you open it, good night, you're going to know that verse. And so by soul winning, if you go soul winning enough, you will have all the salvation verses memorized. And so sometimes I'll try to just use different verses that I'm not used to using just so I can memorize them. Because I figure, hey, if I go, I'll go soul winning with this for the next couple of months, these verses, and I know I'll have these down. And so it's a great way to learn the Bible, soul winning, preaching, teaching someone else the Bible. So number five was comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Number six, pray for God to teach you the Bible. Number seven, go soul winning, preach, teach the Bible, and you'll learn a lot that way. Number eight, memorize the Bible. Memorize the Bible. Now, I started memorizing the Bible a lot when I was 17 again, when I started reading through the Bible. And here's what I did. I said, you know what, I'm going to pick just the most complicated, hardest to understand, weirdest thing in the Bible that I just don't have a clue what it's talking about. And that's what I'm going to memorize, because then I'll under- I mean, I'm going to understand it by the time I quote it three or four or five hundred times. And so that's what I did. This is what I learned. The book of Habakkuk. I said, hey, I'm going to memorize the book of Habakkuk. This is when I was 17. And I'm going to memorize the book of Joel. Because I read those books, and I just could not understand what they were talking about. They just went right over my head. And I memorized those books when I was 17 years old. I was working at a, at a theme park called Thunderland. Okay? And my whole job, this is my job. I open the little gate and all the little kids come and get on the ride. I shut the gate and I push the green button. And I stand there for about three minutes. And three minutes go by, I push the red button. The ride stops. I open the gate again. The kids leave. That was my whole job. Just open the gate, shut the gate. Push the green button, push the red button. Open the gate, shut the gate. So, all day long, I just I had my 3 by 5 cards. I was just learning the Bible. And work, I worked at that job for two months. And in two months, I learned the book of Habakkuk, just three chapters. I learned the book of Joel, three chapters. And I learned about maybe four or five other chapters in there. And so, I'll tell you what. 
I knew the book. I knew the book of Habakkuk after that. I mean, I could explain to you everything about the book of Habakkuk. I could tell you what it was about. I could tell you what chapter one's about. I could tell you what chapter two's about. What chapter three's about. I could tell you why it's so important. I could tell you. I mean, I could preach a whole series of sermons right now. I could preach for hours on the book of Habakkuk right now. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> but anyway, I literally could because. When you memorize something in the Bible, God will teach you that in a special way. So if there's something in the Bible that you like, that you really want to learn about, or, maybe, or something that you just don't understand at all, like I did, if you memorize it, boy, God will just open it up to you. Another books that I wanted to memorize was First and Second Timothy and Titus, because those are books written from a preacher, Paul, to a young pastor. Timothy was a pastor, Titus was a pastor. I memorized those books, First, uh, Second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Because then I want to know what God is saying to a pastor. How to be a pastor. What you, what you should preach like. What you should be like. And so I wanted to memorize those so that God could teach me those. And the books that I have memorized right now are the books that I understand the best. There are parts of the Bible, I'll admit to you, there are parts of the Bible that are a little bit of an enigma to me that I don't really understand. Or maybe if you ask me exactly where something is in a certain book, I wouldn't be able to tell you. But the stuff that I've memorized, of course I could tell you. Because God will teach you the Bible in a special way when you memorize the Bible. You say, well, I just have such a hard time memorizing. I'll be honest with you. I have a difficult time memorizing too. My wife literally can memorize stuff at least four or five times faster than me. Is that true? I mean, it's the truth. She, I mean, it, it irritates me. Because one time we both started this little program for memorizing. And I mean, she just blew my doors off. She had a whole chapter down in like two hours or something. I'm on like verse four. And she will blow my doors off. I mean, she can memorize stuff just like that. It's nothing to her. But see, to me, I literally, I have to work at it hard. I mean, I have to just say it over and over. I have literally been stuck on like one verse for like an hour. Just quoting the same verse. I mean, seriously, I just have like a mental block. And I just cannot get one verse down for an hour, literally. And other times, obviously, I move faster than that. But I get stuck. But I'll tell you something. The more that you do it, your mind is like a muscle. And you'll start to get better at it. You'll start to get a mind. And now I'm to the point from memorizing a lot of the Bible, where I'll just memorize stupid stuff. I mean, I'll see a billboard and just memorize it. And I'll find my... I mean, I, the other day I was walking around, and I found myself just chanting a billboard that I saw. Just chanting it like 20 or 30 times. I'm like, what am I doing? Because <laughs> I'm so used to just quoting, you know, verses and learning verses. And so it's something that if you practice at it, if you work at it, you can get good at memorizing. Here's another thing. The, your diet has a lot to do with it too what I preached about several weeks ago about what you eat has a lot to do with how your mind functions and so you can work on memorizing the Bible how do, how do I memorize the Bible? a lot of people have little tricks and I, and I went on the internet and looked for all the memorization tricks and none of them worked for me at all I mean I tried all of them none of them worked I don't know if she's using them maybe you don't use them either None of them work for me, so here's what I do. I just chant stuff over and over 300 times. That's literally what I do. I mean, if I'm going to memorize a verse, and I'm just trying to make this practical, but let's say I was going to memorize the verse, uh, let's see, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And I said, okay, I'm going to memorize Romans 12, 1. This is how I would literally memorize it. And I do this every day. I, it, this is the verse. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, if I wanted to memorize that verse, this is how I would do it. I beseech you therefore, brethren, 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 I beseech you therefore, brethren. Just that little part, literally. And this is how I do it every day. And I'll chant that for ten minutes. Just in my mind, not out loud, or else I lose my voice. But I just say, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. 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 I beseech you, therefore. You, you say, doesn't that get boring? I don't. It does. It's not boring to me, because I love the Bible and I love God's word, and I just am meditating on God's word and thinking about. It. And then I'll just say, by the mercies of God, 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 by the mercy. And this is how I have to do it. I have to break down the little parts to be able to do it. I'm serious. And so then, then I'll put them together. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. And yeah, it takes work. It takes a long time. It takes over and over and over again. And I'll tell you something. Yes, it's not always the funnest thing in the world to memorize the Bible one little piece at a time. Five words at a time. Memorizing the entire Bible is a lot of work, okay? But I'll tell you something. It's great 
once you've got it memorized, then you like the fact that you have it memorized. See, it's a lot of hard work to memorize it. But boy, when you can just walk down the street and just quote to yourself an entire chapter of the Bible, boy, God will speak to you. God will teach you the Bible when you can do that. When you can quote to yourself an entire chapter of the Bible, boy, it's, the, it's power. I love it. And so, yes, it's work. And I, I venture to guess that anybody can do it the way that I do it. Because I do it a dumb way. Anybody can do it like that. And so, hey, instead of just letting your mind just wander, you ever heard the phrase, an idle mind is the devil's workshop? You ever heard somebody say that before? You know, you're at work and your mind starts wandering. What does it think about? It goes into all the filth. I mean, it go, it, when, when my mind just wanders off into la-la land, I'll start, I might start thinking about some, some filthy movie that I watched when I was a teenager. I might start thinking about uh, when I was a teenager, I used to watch like four or five hours of just Comedy Central on cable television. And that's, that's garbage, let me tell you that right now. I, I, it'll just go back to all the rock music that I listened to as a teenager. All the songs will start coming to my head. I don't want my mind to just float around. I'm going to take control of my mind. I'm going to grab my mind and shake it and say, you're going to think about the Bible. And I'm going to say, quote this over and over 500 times. And I get my mind into subjection. I get my mind under control because I don't want my mind full of trash. And so I say, I'm just going to meditate on the Bible. Now look, all of us have stuff in our mind that we wish wasn't there from the past, from sin, from, from, you know, maybe before we had certain standards of convictions or when we did things that were wrong, when we shouldn't have done them, and we looked at something we shouldn't have looked at, we listened to something we shouldn't have looked at, we did something we shouldn't have done. Look, we all have filthy things in our mind. Let's face it. I'm not going to lie to you. I have garbage in my mind. And, but I'm not just going to let that stuff just float around in my mind and float around in my mind. I am going to take control of my mind. And the Bible says that we should bring every thought into subjection. That's what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Bring every thought into subjection. I control what I think about. I don't just let my flesh control what I think about. I decide that I'm going to quote this Bible a hundred times in a row, this one little phrase. And it will keep me out of trouble. And it fills my mind with the Word of God. So memorizing the Word of God is probably the greatest tool that I've discovered for learning the Bible. Because I'll learn more. I mean, good night. On Wednesday nights when I teach through those Bible studies... I'm constantly just having to decide where am I going to spend my time because there's so much to teach. Because there's so much in each of these chapters. Why? Because I've memorized it. And that's why it's so vitally important to memorize the Bible. And it's for, I think it's for everybody. Because he said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. That's a command of God. And so God commands you to memorize the Bible. Look, start out small. Start out just memorizing a few verses that you like. Pick a really uh, psalm. Pick a psalm that you like. Just something short. And say, it's going to be my first chapter that I memorize. Just this psalm. Psalm 23. Good night. I mean, that's pretty short. And that's famous. You've heard it a lot. It'd be easy to memorize. Psalm chapter 1. Same thing. Very commonly heard. It's short. Learn those verses. And start out small. Start out with John 3.16. But get God's word in your heart. Can you imagine one day, and, and you say, well, this is goofy. This is like off the deep end. But hey, can you imagine one day somebody taking the Bible away from you? Because that could happen, couldn't it? I mean, could it happen that somebody would take the Bible away from you? Has it ever happened before in history that the Bible's been taken away out of people's hands? Yes, it has. Hey, could it happen that somebody could go to jail and, and not have a Bible? Or just the Bible could be made illegal? I mean, look at Adolf Hitler. He's burning Bibles. He's burning books. And so, yes... You know what the first thing I'd do if I was in jail and I didn't have my Bible? I'd just start quoting the Bible. I'd, I'd, get, I'd start just carving it into the wall of the jail cell. The Bible. I'd just start out and just write down every chapter that I knew. I'd just start shouting at the top of my lungs every chapter that I knew. I would quote it over and over and over again because nobody can take my Bible away from me. The only way that somebody can take my Bible away from me is to, is to put a bullet through my head. Because, I, because I've, got it, I've got a lot of it memorized. And so get the Word of God in your heart. You'll never be without your Bible. You want to win somebody to the Lord? That lost loved one? You have the perfect opportunity? Oh, I don't have my Bible. If you know the verses, you can win them to the Lord. If you don't know the verses, you can't win them to the Lord. Because your wisdom, that man's wisdom teacheth, is not what's going to get him saved. It's the words that the Holy Ghost teacheth that's going to get him saved. Learn the Bible. Learn the verses. Number nine. When you're reading the Bible, this is the next study tip. Number nine. Look for similar phrases and similar wording. 
things that are worded similar. Now, this comes into play a lot when you memorize the Bible, because when you memorize the Bible, you see every little nuance, because you've quoted it so many times. And so you'll notice similar phraseology. Look, if you would, are you in Romans? If you're in, get in Romans chapter 10. I think you should be in maybe like Romans chapter 12. Put, get your finger in Romans chapter 10, and then get your other finger in Genesis chapter 4. And I could, I could give you a million examples on this one because there's so many things in the Bible that are just similar wording that you pick up and you can kind of see things and, and learn truth from things that are worded in a similar way. But look at Genesis 4, chapter number 26. Here's just a random example that I thought of. Genesis 4, 26 says, And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Now that phrase right there, probably jumps out at you. Call upon the name of the Lord. And you say to yourself, huh, I wonder, where have I heard that before? Where have I heard that phrase, call upon the name of the Lord? Well, in Acts chapter 2, verse 21, it says, and it shall come to pass, that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's close. Call on the name of the Lord. This here says to call upon the name of the Lord, but look at Romans 10, where your finger is. Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, it can't be a coincidence that those phrases are exactly the same. Call upon the name of the Lord. If the Bible says in, in the very earliest part of history, Seth is Adam's son. His son's name is Enos. It says, Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. It's talking about people getting saved as a result of this man Enos. And then in Romans chapter 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Joel chapter 2, 28 says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. And so on and on, you'll see that phrase, Call upon the name of the Lord. You can learn something about the Bible. You can understand, what does it mean in Genesis 4 when it says, Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Well, you study the rest of the Bible, you find out people were getting saved. That's what it means, because you see it in Romans 10, 13, because you see it in Acts 2, 21. Watch for just similar phrases, similar wording. And then number 10, and I saved one of the most important ones for last, not the longest part of the sermon, because I know the air conditioner is broken, but not the longest part of the sermon, but one of the most important ones that you must know when you're studying the Bible. And this will revolutionize the way you study the Bible. Number 10, realize that the Bible has everything you need to know about every subject. And I know I've said that before, but I repeat that because it's so important. That will change your interpretation of the Bible dramatically. If you say the Bible has everything I need to know about every subject. I mean, think about it. There are people who say, well, you know, the Bible's not really clear on this, and so here's what I think about it. And they'll say, yeah, I know the Bible says that there, but, you know, that may not be everything that there is to it. I mean, come on, the Bible was written 2,000 years ago. They didn't have thus and so back then, and they didn't have this back then. And so it was a whole different world. Look, Ecclesiastes says there's nothing new under the sun. There is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything more of it maybe said? See, this is new. It had been already of old time, which was before us. That's why he said, there's nothing new under the sun. Nobody can say, behold, this is new. Hey, it's already old. It's, it, we've had it. And so here's the thing. It goes back to what I was saying this morning about birth control. It's mentioned one time in the Bible. That's all I need to know. You see what I mean? See how you'd interpret it? Other people might just say, oh, that's just an individual story. That's just an isolated incident. But see, with my philosophy that says, look, the Bible is all I need to know. You know, homosexuality. I preached a sermon about the sodomites. Hey, the Bible has everything I need to know about homosexuality. I look at homosexuality in the Bible... Three times there's a story, all three times the homo is trying to force somebody else to do something that they don't want to do. All three times. So I deduce from that, that's what they're about, that's what all of them are about. Because that's all the ones in the Bible are about. And, and I can, on and on. What is, you know, alcohol. The Bible has everything I need to know about alcohol. The first time alcohol is mentioned, Genesis chapter 9, Noah's being violated by his son. Second time alcohol is mentioned in the Bible, Lot is being violated by his two daughters. Habakkuk 2.15 Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor to drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. See, throughout the Bible, God is saying alcohol is a tool used by one person to take advantage of another person. 
All throughout the Bible. It's the first time it's mentioned. It's the second time it's mentioned. It's associated in the Bible with nudity. It's associated with fornication. It's associated with cursing. It's associated with false religion. On and on throughout the Bible. associated with the devil. On and on. And so you say, well, I just think social drinking is okay. Look, the Bible has everything I need to know about alcohol. And so I'm just going to look at every verse on alcohol. And then that's all I need to know about it. I don't need anything else. And if you understand the Bible that way, that will change the way that you study the Bible. So, number one, let's go back through these quickly so that we can review and you can remember these. Number one, make sure you have the right Bible. Don't waste your time studying and saying, but it's easier to understand. It's so much easier for me to understand the New King James Version. Look, it's easy to understand the cat in the hat. It's easy to understand hop on pop. It's easy to understand red fish, blue fish, one fish, two fish. It's easy to understand green eggs and ham. But my friend, what's the point of understanding it? What's the point? What's the point of understanding something that God didn't write? That's not perfect. What's the point of understanding something that's wrong? You can understand it all you want. You're understanding the wrong things. But if you understand the King James Bible, I'd rather understand one-tenth of what God said than... Nine-tenths of something that God did not say. You're wasting your time. So number one, make sure you got the right Bible. Number two, get a Bible that's only the Bible. That's what I recommend. Maybe you're not like this, but I get extremely distracted by all the notes and things. I find myself using them a lot. And so I just try to find... I go to the bookstore and I just search and seek out where is the Bible that has the least superfluous things in it. That's just the text of the Bible. That's my criteria. Number three, read the Bible five times cover to cover before you begin to study the Bible. That's important to read the whole thing. Now, memorize the Bible while you're reading it five times, but don't dissect it with a microscope until you get the big picture. That's all all I'm saying with that. And by the way, the word read, read, reading, is used 76 times in the Bible. The word study is only used three times in the Bible. So God placed an emphasis on reading. It's more important that you read the Bible than that you study the Bible. Seventy-six times he's telling you to read. Three times he says study. One of them is negative. Two of them are positive. So two positive references to studying the Bible in the entire Bible. Reading is all throughout the Bible 76 times. That's where the emphasis is. Number four, go with the statement above the story. Number five, compare spiritual things with spiritual. Compare the Bible with the Bible to find out what things mean. Number six, pray for God to teach you the Bible. Number seven, go soul winning, preach sermons, teach people the Bible, talk about the Bible with your friends or loved ones, and you will learn the Bible by doing that. Number eight, memorize the Bible. Number nine, look for the similar phrases, look for similar words. Find a word here, find the same word here, find the same phrase here and here. Look for the pattern. And number ten, realize that the Bible has everything that you need to know, and I mean this, everything that you need to know about every subject. Everything. This is it right here. This has all the answers. There's no answer that's on this book. Maybe I don't know the answer from this book, but it's in there, and I'm going to keep looking until I find it. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. God, I thank you so much for the Bible. Well, I don't know what I would do without the Bible. I would hate to live life without the Bible. What, what would I think about all day? A bunch of trash? A bunch of garbage that I have in my mind, dear God? Thank you so much for the, the Word of God that can just clean up my mind and just... Fill me with the Spirit of God by, by reading the Bible, by meditating on the Bible. Thank you so much that I live in 2006. What a treasure to have the Bible, the Word of God in my hand. This is my most prized possession, dear God. And Father, I just pray that you would please just use this message in some way.